Welcome to the Spitfire Audio Academy's panel on global collaboration. Now, I am so excited to be joined by my esteemed panel today. We're going to be talking about the challenges of the last 18 months because it has been challenging no matter what kind of industry you're in. We're going to talk about those challenges, how everyone faced them, and also which of the skills that everyone has learned that people are taking forward into the rest of 2021 and even beyond. So I'm so delighted to be joined by media composer Shruti Kumar, engineer Fiona Crookshank, musician Shabaka Hutchings, and game composer Ben McDougall. Now, before I get into grilling you, okay, I'm not going to grill you, I promise I'm not going to grill you, but let's do a little bit of an introduction. So I'll introduce myself very briefly, just a sentence or two about who you are and what you do and where we might know you from, um, and then, then we'll go on with the grilling interviews, sorry. So yes, I'm Louise Blaine, I'm a writer and presenter, and you might have heard me on Radio 3's Sound of Gaming. So let's start with, with you, Shruti. I'm Shruti Kumar. I'm a composer. I write for a screen and I also produce records a lot and I am based in Los Angeles. Perfect. Adding to our global collaboration, we are currently in different places with very different setups. So I think that will probably happen if anyone comes into a room or anything like that. We'll kind of, we'll embrace that as we go as well. So on to you, Fee. <laughs> I'm Fee Crookshank. Um, I'm an engineer, mixer and producer. I mainly work in kind of TV and film, but also um, on records as well and games and samples sometimes. Shabaka? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm Shabaka Hutchings. I, I play the saxophone, the clarinet and compose. Uh, I'm in three groups, Shabaka and your ancestors, Sons of Kemet and the Comet is Coming. And you, Ben? Uh, hi, I'm Ben McDougall. I'm a composer. I'm based uh, also in Los Angeles. Uh, and I write music for uh, video games, uh, trailers, all sorts, really. Uh, and you've probably uh, seen my stuff, if anywhere, uh, in the PlayStation 5 and now PlayStation 4 game, Godfall. Nice plug there at the end, Ben. But yes, we'll, uh, <laughs> I think let's let's start with you, Shruti. Obviously, uh, productions have been productions have been on hold we've had things being cancelled we've had everything moving around and things are starting now but over the last 18 months what's your experience been like and really your sort of compositional process how has that changed over the last year and a half so interestingly at the beginning of lockdown i was in london um <laughs> over there with you guys with some of you guys and um i really everything changed for me because i didn't have a home studio there so i was working out of uh, external studios there and ended up having to work in my kitchen until I came back to Los Angeles, which surprisingly was really interesting because I had a set amount of tools and I was able to pull it off. And then I had all these existential crises of why I was spending so much money on my gear at home when, when actually I was able to pull it off with, with my software um, in my kitchen. So that being said, uh, physically things changed, uh, tools wise, things changed until I got back to Los Angeles. Um, and then, yeah, I actually was about to rec start recording a record that I'm working on and all the sessions were canceled, um, as they should have been. And I was just grappling with the fact that, okay, this is going to be a setback, but everyone was going through it. And at the same time that my sessions were canceled and these wonderful players, you know, had to stay home and everyone had to stay home. A lot of amazing friends of mine who were also touring musicians um, were also suddenly available. So while my sessions were canceled, my pool of collaborators grew very quickly all at once. So what I did actually in my very um, impulsive beginning of lockdown craze was start an online platform to connect my player friends with my producer and composer friends. So that was like the first step. Um, and when that started happening, I realized that people's creative projects changed completely because we're like, oh my God, now I can get this amazing guitarist from Chicago to play on my record because they're not on tour anymore. So there was a bit of rejigging in my head because I write very specifically for, for the players that I'm writing for, if I'm going to do live, um, when I can. Um, there was a lot of rejigging as to how I was going to arrange and record my stuff. I mean... This is going to be a long conversation. I'm sure we'll get into it of how we did that in the end, how we recorded remotely. But um, I think the biggest change for me was actually in a positive sense. I'm going to keep it positive. Um, the projects became more personal and I, and I began to collaborate much more um, intimately with my players and uh, collaborators as well. Engineers like B, which we'll talk about later. <laughs> I think we, we will, but... 
in terms of that collaboration, let's get into the tech of that. So when you suddenly realized that you could bring everybody together, what were the kind of challenges that suddenly became, oh, we're used to people going into studios or we're used to people doing things from home. So what what were the learnings there and what were the maybe big win outs in terms of tech that you used? Or win out. Okay, so the big difference, I actually couldn't bring everyone together. So I was working with everyone intimately, individually. <laughs> And then yeah. bringing them together myself with my dazzling engineering skills. Um, no, but um, no, I mean, I was one on one working with everybody. So a lot of it, you know, when choosing who I was hiring to record, um, I obviously would prefer players who had played together already, even if they were recording remotely, because then I, they knew how each other played. Um, we were able to have like group conversations again, like the pre-production of the recording was way more intense than it had ever been for me. You know, if I was going to walk in a studio, be able to talk to a group, try things, you know, take, you know, have many takes. Um, many of these players also um, had never engineered themselves before, had didn't know how to record themselves. So there was a lot of also onboarding. How do you record yourself? How do you set up your mic? If you're in an apartment like me right now and your, your sound is less than desirable, how do we make our sound as best, you know, work as best as possible? And then, um, so it was a lot of, uh, you know, but the win outs, I suppose, um, he actually told me about, I work in Cubase sometimes. I mean, mostly other logic, but uh, VST Connect Pro helped a lot because uh, I could track remotely that way. And Audio Movers was our, our game changer for, in terms of tech. Um, you know, other things, but I also had to have like a Zoom session open and, you know, we can talk about this later and he probably has your own version of this, how, you know, my voice is coming out of four different um, channels <laughs> and everyone else, I'm hearing myself four times and everyone else sounds great, but, you know, um, there were, there's a lot of um, shuffling around, but I think in terms of tech, those were the win outs and, and this online platform, though, I think the bigger win out was the I mean, you can say Zoom and, you know, social media also, like people who were connecting through these platforms and um, and then the hours of conversation needed and planning needed before we actually got into recording. So I know I could talk about this forever and I'm sure other people have things to weigh in here, but... Um, well, I think um, Fee and you, you both work together on a project. Can you both, can you talk us through that project, how you got involved, what happened and what the result was from obviously working remotely to do it? Okay, so I, I the record I was working on is what Fee helped me with and totally game changed. We just sent it to Masters yesterday, which was exciting. Um, but um, I met Fee at Spitfire, I think. <laughs> when I first got to London, I think Saffron did the Tech Dissect uh event, but also I work very closely with an engineer in Los Angeles named Eva Reistad, who we jokingly and lovingly say is the Los Angeles version of Fee. So, you know, I, I, I used to work at, I used to work at remote control, um, and in Los Angeles and I met Eva actually in a different studio, but we've all sort of crossed paths in the film world. And so I just knew that I had to work with Fee when I wanted to record my record at the same time, I had become friends um, over there with the LCO uh, guys, especially Rob Ames, who connected me to Hugh. And so Hugh said that he would record my record. Um, but I think you guys were just about to go into lockdown too, <laughs> I think. Yeah, because we did it in October, didn't we? So it was... Uh, right, October 30, like 31st. It was the one year yes. anniversary of my entry to London, actually. Um, so I will tell you now, um, I mean the scores were made way more detailed for me. The parts were way more detailed. My email to poor Hugh, who is the conductor of LCO, who is amazing, was <laughs> I wrote him like a 10 page email with passes and things that we had to do and try. And we talked on the phone so much more than I think I would have ever talked to anybody who was conducting a session. Um, but the first time someone other than me had conducted a session of mine, right? So it was a really interesting thing where I had to become way closer with everyone I was working with um, because I wasn't in the room. And then Fee came on board and she's just a champ and she can explain the, what we recorded at Church Studios in <laughs> London. And I was sitting yes. where I'm sitting right now um, at like four in the morning. I think I, I also was late that time too. Um, and um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, Fee, why don't you come in for a second? Yeah, so then, so I guess Shruti asked me to do it and sent me the demos and, and that kind of part of it was kind of normal, I suppose, that I heard the music in advance and then 
we we talked about my setup and how Eva would mix it and you know how I was going to record it and all that stuff so that's like fairly normal but then when you get to the studio the difference is trying to work out how everyone can communicate and I've done that much more successfully on different sessions but on this one <laughs> we had a problem with um interfaces and and laptops and so we were sending shooter feed by audio movers which is all simple all good and we were trying to speak over zoom but the interface wasn't working so I couldn't plug her into the desk and so we had like a zoom laptop behind me where we would talk and then Hugh had a laptop next to him on the stand and and we'd you know she'd be talking to the orchestra through a laptop which is not ideally how we do it but I'll, I'll tell you the ideal way in a bit. but the main thing was she could hear everything as it was going down live and make comments and feedback immediately and the orchestra could hear their her ideas and then still you know they could still collaborate even though no, it was surprisingly low latency like nothing I mean the only thing the funny thing was that I was hearing myself four times <laughs> and then yeah. everyone else which I thought you know everyone else was fine um but the session was brilliant actually I think in terms of everyone being spaced out further apart in the studio. Um, I, I noticed in post um, that some, you know, how we arrange really affects those kinds of sessions. So I started post this session arranging very differently for groups that were in a studio that were spaced out because what can you hear? Who's behind a thing? Um, is tuning going to be an issue? If you're writing close harmonies and you're sitting yeah. very far apart and you're used to having, you don't have a stand partner, um, you got to write differently for, for that kind of thing. And, Hugh and I had like talked about that a bit before. So there was rearranging before, right until the very morning of the session, just to make sure that it was an optimal sort of arrangement for this setup, but musical arrangement. But then um, other than that, I think it was, it was pretty smooth. And, and the, a nice thing that came from this actually because of everyone's spaced outness, I was able to use um, the tracking that we so brilliantly did at church. Um, and I did a lot of reamping and sampling and um, processing on these strings as well as using them the way they were in a way that I probably couldn't have as successfully done um, maybe in the earlier kinds of sessions where everyone was closer and there was way more bleed, et cetera. Like there was a lot more isolation in a way that I was able to do a lot more intense production. Um, and then alternatively to all this in this record, I have to throw in that, um, because I had all these global collaborators all of a sudden, um, this was like a very nice version of remote collaboration, but I've used iPhone recordings from people in India and Africa too during this time as well. Um, and cleaning up audio became another like huge uh, lesson of mine this time. I like isotope saved my life, but, and then working with, you know, non-traditional audio, like if it's not going to be a clean vocal, how can we make this a thigh view vocal? You know what I mean? But, or something like that, like, really leaning into the imperfections and making some new aesthetic choices in my production. So um, it became a really interesting time to collaborate and sort of dispel these notions of what we need to do to make a clean product and really adventure into some new territory with some incredible people. So <laughs> I think I'm um, talking about that fee being an engineer, you're obviously quite used to remote work. You know, I think we've all got to remember that while we've only been able to do it before, the tech was very much growing for a long time and a lot of people have used it. I mean, we've been working globally for a long time. It's just suddenly we all had to. So I, I take it for you, people checking in remotely wasn't a particularly strange thing, but did you then have to sort of hone in, this is the way this is going to work? Because obviously studios for you must have become much more restrictive. People just couldn't come in. So that was suddenly all you had. So did you come up with a sort of dream setup quite early on? Yeah, that was exactly it. Now, I guess the, the numbers in control rooms are so much more limited and particularly in film and, and TV, we'd always had that remote setup because there are a lot of composers who might just want to do one session in London and can't, you know, fly over just for that. But as you say, now doing that for everyone all the time, um, certainly Air and Abbey Road and, and the other big London studios, but there was a lot of communication between Air and Abbey about, you know, oh, what are you using? How are you doing that? Different types of software. Um, there's There was obviously Source Connect, which we used to use a lot, but when everyone started using Source Connect, it kind of fell over. Um, so we, we started using different types of technology like Clearview, but Audio Movers became a big one. And Audio Movers and Zoom seems to be something that I can take around with me to the smaller studios that don't have the kind of setup that Air and Abbey Road 
you know, when I go to the church or some other smaller places, I have to do the sort of comm side myself um, on my laptop, like, as I say, with an interface that I've borrowed or that I've brought in or... Um, but Air, obviously, and Abbey Road have a sort of whole separate rig system for communications. They've got audio movers set up. Everyone speaks through Zoom um, so that you can kind of keep the latency down on the, the, the communications and the feedback on takes and stuff. But then audio movers, if their internet isn't so great, the other end, you can increase the latency and they can hear at a better quality kind of thing. So that's how we've worked out is the one of the smoothest ways anyway. <laughs> Did it turn, did sessions become longer? Did you suddenly have to take more things into account? Did you find that your sort of, your your flow changed that way? Or do you think initially there was a couple of hiccups, but then it just became more normal? Yeah, I think that's probably it. There are a couple of hiccups and then we got a system down. It takes longer to set up and there does tend to be ideally a kind of testing stage before the session where you get the composer to log in and, and make sure they can hear clearly and you know, that you can talk to them clearly through the desk and that all the, the lines are working, basically. Um, but then on the actual session, hopefully the flow isn't that different. But it just does make you realise that the communication is the most important thing. You know, and, and if people can't talk to each other, you know, if something goes wrong with the audio feed and they're like, oh, I didn't hear that take, sorry. As long as you can immediately say, I'm so sorry, you know, this this has happened, we'll get back to you one moment and then play them the take back. Or, you know, but if they if you can't talk to each other, then you can't <laughs> run a recording session. And if they can't talk to the musicians, then and you need to make them feel like they're there, basically, the clients. Because um, this is like a big deal and they're missing the fun part, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, to have an open line between them, the musicians, the conductor, and really feel like they're collaborating and there's nothing holding them back is so important. And because of that being the fun part, obviously we're kind of, we're slightly more, we're a little more unlocked now. We we're in social distancing and what's it been like sort of having people gradually come back? Has it just been, has it been happy making for you thinking it was much better? I was managing you far better at home. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, oh, it's so nice to have people back. I mean, we're very lucky that we were able to record basically from like last June in London, the studios were back open and everyone was socially distanced, but at least we could work, you know, and musicians paid which is the big the big thing but it, yeah I, I really love having the clients there particularly the composer I think it's really hard for them to produce remotely because it is so dependent on how their internet is at their end as, as well as you know cause if, if the, all these little breakdowns happening and then they're not sure if if it was an internet glitch or if it was someone playing a wrong note or if it you know just for their confidence it's so much nicer to have have them in the studio and just generally more fun I'm a very social person so well speaking of of social and having musicians back and getting musicians paid and being involved Shabaka yeah. the last 18 months has been I mean in the way that suddenly you're no longer performing or you're no longer with your band you're no longer directly in contact what's it been like for you experientially have you set everything up in your home office and home setup and what's your what's your setup like so at the for the last year I've been developing a setup. I'm very much a musician musician in that I studied classically um and at the guild hall and the training was great on an instrumental level in terms of teaching us the repertoire and teaching us how to play instruments but in terms of a global view of a recording musician and in terms of the 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 facilities that you know we kind of need to survive outside of just going and actually physically playing our our instruments we you know I really wasn't that prepared for and I got away with it because I was quite successful as a practical musician for all these years so I never had to worry about recording myself if I needed to record I go to a studio and someone always did that side of it for me and I'm so you know I've always been so busy I always said you know I need to learn you know more logic than just cutting up you know something or just doing some very basic procedures on there um so this whole you know, period has been me like getting my first, you know, decent mic, you know, a kind of 414, getting a decent audio interface. All of these is like, it's very rudimentary things, you know, to, you know, obviously people who do it uh, a lot and are just kind of making shifts in um, a kind of musical worldview that already included some of these technologies before. But for me, it was like entering the door 
of this world that had already been out there and realizing that I really was operating in a different time, you know, a different time. Um, and I, I survived pretty well doing it. But actually now that I've, you know, got my setup, which is basically just the, the 414 going into an Apogee Duet interface so that I can actually take the whole thing outside. I live by a, a nature reserve, so I've been doing a lot of recordings out um, with the birds and just out, you know, in different kind of locations around. And then just using Ableton. And, and I kind of like the idea of hardware. So I, I like to record things into the 505 loop station as channels and then alter them on there just so and then play into Ableton or play into Logic so that I'm actually doing stuff with my hands in real time. Um, and these are all procedures that just make the act of composing stuff for my bands or or just getting ideas a lot more, you know, hands on. It just the whole process has become um, more fun than just getting on Sibelius and writing my songs or just doing it on a on a keyboard. Now that I've just got a lot more ways of getting out ideas. So, you know, I'm I'm really grateful to the time that this period has allowed me to actually be able to just learn learn new things. It's been hours of just watching YouTube tutorials. Um, I've also got the MPC, so that's the other side of it. It's like the MPC, the 505, um, going into a, a little mixing desk and then having that run into the either Ableton or having the 505 and or having the I've got a little um, Roland Hand Sonic that I like to kind of make drums on having that and the MPC run in through the mixing desk into the 505 and have that control things. Um, so yeah, just been making a, a load of music and. Um, we recorded the, the first bit of the Sons of Kemet album, which came out just um, a few months ago. We recorded that just before the pandemic. So normally what happens is that we record for a really long periods of time. We don't like to take a lot of takes. We'd rather just leave the tape rolling and play one tune for half an hour and find a good four minutes within that um, rather than doing lots of takes. So it means that practically I've got a lot of information, a lot of musical material to deal with and this is what I had at the start of the the lockdown a whole bunch of stuff so I was listening to it and trying to figure out how we were going to craft an album from the massive material that we had and then I you know I was listening to a lot of Camito Pascal and listening to just the layers of, of um, instrumentation that he's got in his tunes a lot, obviously it's a lot of it is done live but just getting into my head that idea of density you know, an idea of depth in terms of music. It doesn't have to just be what the band recorded. So, you know, I'm sitting at home and thinking, actually, I've got all these little instruments, all these flutes and, you know, the stuff. I can actually just, with the equipment that I've got, start experimenting and trying to compose um, alongside what the band had already recorded. And that's what got all the, the layers of composition on the, the album. Um yeah, they were all just made in, in the lockdown from me using the skills that I just acquired out of necessity, you know. Well, going with those skills that you acquired out of necessity, it sounds like it sounds like you really embraced them. Does that mean, do you think you're going to think in the future of whether, of when you want to record and where you want to record and suddenly what you want to be able to do yourself now, now that you know that you can be in control of it? Yeah, I mean, it's just opened up a whole different you know, dimension to me, one in terms of the language that I speak to um, the producers with. So normally in terms of producing the albums, I'll be there in the sessions, but I, I'll i be kind of speaking musically and uh, produce, the mixing engineer will translate what I say musically into the technological aspect. Whereas now I at least know some of that language so I can actually, you know, say what I want in a more clear way and the process is just going to be a lot faster um, it just means that when I'm actually looking for studios, because I can actually do more stuff with the audio, um, I can actually craft it to my liking before it even goes to the mixing process. It means that I'm going to be looking for different types of studios. Before it was just like, you know, it's just, just the studio have a good vibe. And either it's that we're playing together in the room or we're not, or we're playing the separation. Now it's going to be a little bit more specific because I've got a, a bigger idea of actually how I like my sax to be resonating in the room, you know, from playing in the same room for like a year. Now I know like, you know, I, I know that if I sit in the middle of the room, it's got this kind of sound. If I sit in my like bathroom, it's got this kind of sound. So in studios, it's not just that I kind of go in and sit down and turn the mic on. It's got to actually have the right, the right kind of resonance to make me feel, you know, satisfied at the end. 
I so wondered if this would happen post lockdown because so many musicians were obviously mm-hmm. recording themselves. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people were calling me up at the start, like, what mic do I get? What interface? How do I do this? And where do I put it? And all that stuff. I thought, oh, God, we're going to go back. And everyone's going to be like, no, no, fee, no, doesn't go there. <laughs> it's the instant you know. pros. Yeah. <laughs> but Shmaka, and now going you can on, do that, Shmaka. Exactly. <laughs> so going yeah, on, you, you said, no, yeah. you said you found um, where you preferred the or did you, Was there somewhere in your house you discovered that there was a perfect sound that you didn't expect? Did you, you just mention the bathroom? Yeah, well, the bathroom, <laughs> but even the bathroom, I've got a real small room. But basically, I realised that there's a, um, I like recording some things in the middle of the night. And I, I live in a, in a flat that's got people on the top and to the sides of me. So I can't, I don't like playing loud in the best of times, but I'm not the kind of player that like takes liberties. I don't try to see what I can get away with through the whole lockdown my like side project on a personal level we're trying to see how quiet I can play you know so Mm -hmm. with it still sounding like you know like normal so like how quiet I can and it's a technical thing it's like if I can keep my chops in in gear so that I can actually give a rendition of a tune as if the fade had just been turned down as opposed to changing anything about it um I had a performance of the Copeland Concerto in the Barbican that was live streamed in November. So that, uh, in November, 2020, that was what I was kind of working for to be able to play that concerto at one in the morning so quietly that no one could hear me, but I was still technically actually doing the right thing. And I just about got there, which was what allowed me to actually play the piece nice. that I had to literally practice day <laughs> and night. Um, but because of that, it means that when recording at that like real minuscule dynamic where the, the difference between the breath out numbering the you know out kind of powering the sound of the actual clarinet it's a real like fine balance um and i find like small rooms that are quite resonant so like the bathroom or my small room um it's great for just you know one in the morning i want to record the clarinet but i don't have a padded studio i can get into this small <laughs> resonant room and just play super super quietly and get a real intimate sound with the recording that you wouldn't get if i had the liberty of playing with a more out, outgoing technique, you know, it's a particular sound that actually I associate just with my sound, which is to play out. But I find that having that restriction of playing inwards, you know, it, yeah, there's just a real kind of intimacy that I hadn't really explored before, which was you know, good to kind of get into, you know. I have to jump in here because what you're saying, I talked to so many players about how they were playing so differently when they were recording themselves because they're so used to being in a room near so many mm-hmm. other players. So actually... Uh, the directions that I was giving players changed also, and the references changed also because they were focused on blending, but they were blending either with a pre-record or a um, or a player that had passed on their session to the next player, to the next player, to the next player, if we were doing something like that. So um, tuning, blending, and how they were playing, the techniques became so different. So my directions in my scores became extremely different than it would have been if everyone was playing together in a room, and that was a really interesting conversation so you reminded me of that it's really interesting <laughs> and like my setup uh, my actual like kind of mouthpiece setup changed going in going in the pandemic as well because like normally if you've got a project in a room the what the audience hears on the other side is a completely different thing to what you hear you know a couple of feet away from the clarinet so like my setup in terms of my mouthpiece opening is quite large to, to allow for that kind of projection of sound when you start just hearing yourself through the headphones day after day you realize that you don't need that like um, coarseness that results in a, a beautiful sound projected out. You just need a beautiful sound right there as soon as the sound is is made. Um, and obviously engineers in the studios before would have kind of taken the sound and EQ'd it. But actually when you start recording and recording, I realized that actually shouldn't need to EQ that much. I just need to make a beautiful sound, you know, right there and then adjust my technique or my equipment to do it. Um, so that's been a good thing. I've been able to actually, you know, get a better sound you know, on recordings. Well, I think we can, so we'll move nicely on to Ben, simply because it seems that you've developed a superpower of being able to play perfectly, but no one being able to hear you, which feels like a very special set of skills. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think Ben, as you know, you're, you're a games mm-hmm. composer, a lot of people over lockdown, you know, 
I think studios, there's been a lot of delays in games because a lot of studios have suddenly had to come to terms with working entirely remotely, something like what video game developers call crunches when people are in the development studio all day, all night. Suddenly that's not there and suddenly we've got games moving into 2022 that we were maybe meant to have at Christmas. So last year for you, did your, your, did your sort of experience change immediately or did you already have things, because Godfall was a, was a PS5 release sort of um Correct, yeah. it was an exclusive so was everything in motion for that or what, yeah what so changed? um it had been happening sort of i've been writing in earnest uh, on that project for I'm gonna say six seven months maybe before before lockdown happened uh and actually just as the uh, the stay-at-home order came in uh we moved house so i had a chance to sort of build a studio up just at the right point which was great um so at that point, it was, it was sort of like a head down and, and try and write, and everyone's trying to get used to Zoom, and suddenly there's this idea of uh, the remote... We, you know, it's been, what, 18 months almost? And we forget how bad it was at the start, communication-wise. No, for real, like, it was it was the worst. So uh, and it's come along so far, I and mean, I think we all still have technical issues, but it, it was bad. So <laughs> I, I was... I was uh, head down writing a lot i think we from the, the game side of things there's a service called discord uh, which saved a lot of the the headaches for playthroughs and stuff which are more fun to have in person um that that, that would have been nice but it was cool to be able to watch people play and kind of discuss oh wouldn't it be cool if this happened here or that doesn't quite sit there or oh you know, when did that appear? I should probably you know nod to that um so there was there was an awful lot of that stuff that went on uh as well but you know i'm a composer i write music in a dark room there are there are a lot of memes that that kind of float around <laughs> at the beginning of like life didn't change in that way um uh, there were a lot fewer meetings which was nice because i got a lot more done because uh the la is notorious for its traffic so <laughs> so i was a lot more efficient that's for sure um is that the, what was the question yeah you pretty much <laughs> answered it you got there but in terms of um game competition lots of different game composers have quite different yeah. approaches some people are suddenly given a theme and some concept art and told to go away and develop the entire score because that's how they they want to they want to score but sure. are you do you want to do you are you more hands-on are you constantly seeing the game as it's developed is that something that you like to do or play oh, um, as, as hands-on it's, de- I mean, it's definitely an iterative process. I mean, just by virtue of the fact it's an interactive medium, the the more you can do, the better. The biggest uh, is, is one thing. I mean, you guys have covered s- so many of the, the you know, points <laughs> that I'd, I'd scribbled down uh, to, to talk about the, the whole kind of lockdown music writing thing. But the thing that was a surprise wasn't so much the making the Zoom calls work or the, the day-to-day nuts and bolts, but at a certain point it was harder to be creative. Um, I've, I've always thought of it as being a little like uh, like breathing, yeah, you know, when doing doing the creative thing is breathing out, but at a certain point, you have to take something in. Uh, for me, that was always going to there's there's so many great art galleries and museums in LA. Just going and seeing those. Um, if if you live locally, you probably know the Getty. It's this it's on a mountain. It looks over the whole city. You have to take a little monorail to get up there, and it's full of everything from like ancient sculptures through to modern art. And it's a huge building. There's there's a lot of light. It's it's bright. It's open. And I can just wander those hallways all day. It's super cool. But, you know, that, that all stopped. Suddenly we had to, to look elsewhere for inspiration. And uh, to get to your point, uh, Godfall had so much to draw from. Like, it's, it's, a whole, it's, a whole, it's a new IP. There's, there's a whole world that they've created, and it is pretty. Uh, and, and it was one of the things that made it so, so good for the PS5 was it had this new graphics capability. So everything is sparkly. There's, you know, motes of dust that float in the air and everything sparkles and there's wind in the trees and it's it's sort of a it's a, a paradox from the the violent world that you're playing in but it's gorgeous and there's and there's there's so much to draw from so i kind of i ended up going inwards and sort of just diving deep into that so any any character art i could get my hands on any level art any playthroughs uh, i was just requesting just footage left right and center just to kind of throw up on screen and just in terms of you, you work across multiple mediums, but specifically talking about games, I think people are always very interested when they hear that games have dynamic soundtracks. So a soundtrack that reacts to the player and reacts to everything that you know, everything that we do. And people don't. The lovely thing is that when when we play 
we don't think about it because of we, we've come into combat and it's exciting music and when we stop it calms down so for you what's it like to create to create music that that changes and that's constantly evolving like that well it's very different from writing in a, in a linear medium because it's different every time you've you, you said it perfectly there's a the music has to sound good and it has to sound deliberate whether a player crosses a map in 30 seconds or three hours you, you have to be able to cater to the guy who gets stuck in the corner of the dungeon just, you know, just like hitting against the wall. <laughs> um, or, or the person that knows exactly what they're doing and, and just wins. Uh, it, it all has to sound like it was meant to be there. So you're, you're writing in, in smaller sections, chunks. Uh, it's a <laughs> way less nice word to use. But you know, bits that can move around and, and work on top of each other. So you can, you can raise the, the intensity level if a bad dude shows up or you can drop it down and chill and there's a transition that makes sense uh, at a point that it makes sense. So yeah, there's, there's lots of things that kind of move around and the, uh, the logic of the game is what points to what happens when. So it's all that kind of back, background wizardry that's... Uh, <laughs> it's so amazing. Yeah. Is that part, are you involved in that part at all? Uh, in, in terms of actually putting the stuff into the engine, no, that's far beyond my pay grade. But uh, <laughs> but the the figuring out how how things should happen, and you know, I was certainly making a lot of requests. Uh, in a way, it was uh, weirdly freeing to not understand some of the limitations of why a thing couldn't play at a certain point, because it would make a lot of sense. And actually, there were a couple of times where we were like, "Oh, actually, that would be pretty cool. Let's let's do that. Let's uh, let's make it work." Um, but yeah, there, there are people far more talented at at uh, well, engineering, really, <laughs> than, than me. Did you get to play? Because I know there's. I've been using a service when I get to when I get to play a game. I've been using a service called Parsec, which basically hooks into my PC. I download onto my PC, and suddenly I can play a game through someone else's PC, which has genuinely changed the way that previewing games has as you know you used to have to play in LA or go to London and everyone would sort of surround a very locked PS5 that no one could <laughs> leave the room you know and I think that's really changed so did you get to did you actually get to go hands-on and play the way you wanted to before release? no you you you, uh, you covered it there with the the highly guarded PS5 thing I think there were a couple of units floating around development and I did not get my hands on them so so I, I was writing a lot to uh uh, the word is totally escaped. I was writing a lot to, to linear format, uh, and then and then making those changes based on what was happening. And if something something was too loud or too too much at a certain point, then you know we'd pull it back. It would go back into the engine, and we'd do it all again. And and then these these Discord sessions really help kind of do that kind of on the fly. Had you already recorded pre lockdown? Uh, yes and no. There, okay. there, was, there, was, there was a lot in both directions. Uh, I ended up working with a fabulous cellist uh, in London called uh, Shot Clowder. He's, uh, he also was going through the, the figuring out uh, home recording uh, journey. Shout out if you're uh, watching, by the way. And uh, he was getting very excited about all the, the different microphones that he was getting hold of. He, and for every, every take he'd send, there'd just be like this smush of audio files of like, and it sounds really good on this and that. If you want to have a warm chocolatey sound, then look over here. And, and over times in these, these countless times of sending audio back and forth, I, I began to figure out which, which things worked for which, uh, you know, which sounds for what kind of what intent. There's, there's dark bits, there's, there's pretty bits. Uh, and the mics were different for, for all of them. It is really incredible how much we got to know our players during this time. Yeah. And it's also changed my writing forever because, I mean, in some ways I'm working with way more people than I was working with before, but how intimately I know them and how they play and how they like to play. And it, it informs how I write, right. too. I think that's so cool. Just like you said. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, Shruti, to your point from before, the, the scores that I was sending were getting ever more uh, artistic, let's say, like to a, to a point where I was actually I was just scribbling on things. Like there was there was no way I could notate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hairpins just wouldn't work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, those got far more interesting. I mean, to the point they should probably just go on the wall somewhere. But but yeah, but the end result it, it worked out and it, it brought back some of that that organic uh, interaction maybe that, that that you get. And I think no matter how good the technology becomes. And again, it was terrible 18 months ago. It's, it has improved a lot. You're never going to fully remove the, you know, the glass between people. I mean, never mind control room glass, but the, you know, the distance. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't ever go away fully. 
Yeah. The tricky thing from all of the the remote recording, which has been amazing, is then how do you pull it all together to mix, right? I mean, did you guys mix your own stuff? <laughs> that's that like that's the part that suddenly you're like, oh, this will take a bit longer because yes. you're trying to put all these people in their own houses into one right. kind of space to make yeah, it make one, sense. One cohesive sound. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, apart yeah, from the I, fact that you might have to edit more or whatever for tuning or as you were talking before right. Shruti blending and everything yeah the engineers were like the real saviors I mean and I think there were way more engineering roles created too during this time right because yeah. we're doing all these like big group sessions with mm-hmm. everyone in their homes and then there must be like an extra engineer mm-hmm. sending out the Pro Tools sessions to all the players so they were uniform and make, making sure they were recording the same way and then someone else mm-hmm. like comment I mean there was you guys just saved the day I I literally have so much more respect and I'm also probably hovering around my engineers way more now than they would have ever hoped for before this time. Um, my lifeline. You still get stuff where I did a film the other day and it's like, okay, you've recorded a 44.1 in Logic. This person's 48 at Pro Tools, right? Let me bounce that out there. You know, like, <laughs> uh, right, now I've got the things that I need to put together. You know, like, there's this little process before the, like, mixing creative fun part where you're like, what? <laughs> In terms of we've we've it sounds like we've discovered an awful lot of of positivity and learning and what would you say you're going to take from what you've learned over the last eighteen months? Now we can balance it nicely with with seeing people and joining people in safe ways. What are you? What are your sort of biggest take homes to continue to use? Shruti, you go first. Um. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure everyone's going to have, and I think I've said a lot of this. I think my biggest takeaway, though, I was always someone that preferred to not be um, geographically controlled in terms of who I was working with. So if I was working on a particular thing and I wanted to work with this particular drummer in Nashville, I wanted that drummer in Nashville. So I would always figure out a way to make it work. But now more than ever, um, the positive is that I feel like I'm working with people that I connect with a lot more and I don't so much mind Uh, where I am and where they are. And I think that that has really opened my possibilities in terms of the kinds of music I can record, what I'm able to write. Um, Suddenly, um, LA seems (laughs) very irrelevant to me. Um, No offense to LA. I love LA. I'm glad to be back. But I, you know, it's amazing how much I can uh, work with anyone I want to work with now. And also, um, Give equal. I think a lot of players have it's leveled a playing field a bit as much as possible, and it will continue to do so in terms of also lifting the veil on um, the realities of whose setups are what and who's faring how in the on the musician side of things. So we can be more equitable. We can be more transparent in how we're collaborating, um, how everyone's getting paid, making sure you know how many hours. I mean, the greatest thing and weirdest thing about working remotely with people is there was no hiding the number of hours everyone was putting into something, um, including the players. And I, I have to say that, like, um, I've always thought about this as a composer, but I'm so glad now that it's just undeniable um, the amount of work that everyone had to do during this time and um, sort of just making sure that everyone's treated properly, feeling like they're cared for, and also um, incentivized to do their best work, you know? I mean, beautiful things have come out also from everybody feeling like they are bringing their A-game from their homes, you know? All these layers of, I, I'm nervous because somebody else, like 10 people are watching me in a studio, it's all gone. Everybody's really contributing in such a better way. And so I, I do think my takeaway is that um, my collaborations will continue to be a lot more um, intimate and like personal in terms of who I'm working with and um, and broader too, uh, meaning like I've gained a lot of collaborators as well. So communication has gotten better and I hope that continues. I guess that's the schmaltzy uh takeaway never well i think the the flexibility thing is is the it's the huge takeaway from all of this uh we we all learned that you know some regions it's okay to do online you don't have to be in person for everything and in other cases you realize that actually you really should be in person for some things uh and so there there have been you know eye-opening situations i think in, in both direction um and moving forward, we've, we've all figured that out and we can now all use Zoom. So, <laughs> so it's, I wouldn't be it's surprised if it. a lot of people don't come to mixes anymore. Because that, you know, people mm. always used to want to come to mixes. Maybe I'd get started and then they come and sit in the corner. But then a lot of people are like, it's kind of boring, actually, until 
until you're ready to play me something. This is really dull. And whereas they can be at home doing whatever they're doing, and then I could be like, I've sent you a thing. They go into their own studio, the listening environment they're used to. They get to hear it back in a yeah in a way that they know it so well, and it's really quick for them to give me notes, and then they can go back to looking after the kids or you know making dinner or whatever they were doing. And I wouldn't be surprised if that carries on. Do you think that notes have gotten um, better? in terms of feedback and more sort of organized, I'm wondering from your perspective if the way people mm-hmm. are giving you feedback has become more clear or more streamlined instead of someone just sitting there. Kind of depends on the person. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, yes. And uh, yeah, some people are like, just send me a mix and I'll send you an email of notes. And some people I've been doing like audio movers mix review kind of thing. So I play it to them and or, or I send it, they make notes, and then we do the notes together live. So that's really good, because then it's like, turn it down a bit, or not that much. You know what I mean? Like, how much is a bit? It, it really varies between people in terms of... So, yeah, that's been quite a, a cool thing. Most people have got efficient, but... I've had to tell how much is a bit. I've had to tell so many engineers, it's like, I have to let you know that my baseline, like, extremes, I love extremes. So when I say, exactly. let's be bold, I mean, like, something that you might be uncomfortable doing like that's a- exactly exactly yeah because someone said to me a bit once and I was like okay like two three db and they were like no 10 db 20 db you know like, well, that's not a bit that's quite a lot you know like <laughs> yeah, bold move <laughs> yeah <laughs> Chewbacca is there going to be anything that you're going to take that you're that you're particularly excited to take forward well, I mean, once touring kind of starts proper, like, you know, gigs are coming back, festivals are coming back around now, but it's going to be like the start of next year when things actually start getting hectic. Um, like, so 2019, for instance, I did about 140 gigs in 10 months, which is about a gig every three days, but like consistently. And, you know, it's like, and that the same thing in 2018, the same thing in 2017. And it's like, I'm on the road all the time. Um, so now I'm thinking that actually there's a lot I can do in hotel rooms. You know, there's a lot I can do in like theater spaces when I get there and not, nothing's happening in, you know, in resident spaces, um, which wasn't a possibility before. But, you know, when I think about the amount of dead time that you have on the roads, you know, in just spaces around the world, now that I've actually got a, a mobile recording setup, I can just make use of, of the time, you know, in that you've got to, you know, you've got to make use of your time somehow, like when you're on the road a lot or else you're just going to like bore yourself to death or just do some real harmful stuff because you just don't know what to do. So for me, just having stuff to do on the road is good. And like being able to record myself, you know, it just gives me something to, to, to kind of occupy myself. Do any of you have, if, have you thought over the last 18 months, I wish there was a piece of tech that did X? Has there been something that you would invent if you could and say, this is the one thing, this is the one thing that I really need. Has there been anything that ha- you've not had or has has the, her current setup been able to give you everything pretty much? I other wish than you humans, could obviously. actually <laughs> record a band all together in different places at the same time. Yeah. Conversation. But you cannot. <laughs> I've been having this conversation with people since um, week one of like lockdown, end of March 20, whatever that year was, um, 2020 yeah. in London, I, I immediately started calling everyone, like a crazy person being like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I think even Fee got some email yeah. being like, we're figuring this out right now. And everyone's like, slow yeah. your roll. We're not going to figure it out that fast. You know, but, um, you know, my um, expectations have tempered, but yes, it would be amazing. I still feel like so many people are working on it now. Um, and there's so many different versions of it. Um, um, I for, I'm forgetting, um, Tim Exile, what is, what is that app, the Jam app, that uh, e- Endless FM, it's called, also based in London, but um, they were able to do like real-time jamming, but the recording capabilities were bad. VST Connect Pro is amazing, but really for only one or two, maybe one player at a time, but amazing that it records mm-hmm. directly into your DAW. Then we have like um, Audio Movers, which has worked great for just remote recording, but I would love exactly there to be something like this where we could all play real time with low latency, but latency is such a nut, like a tough nut to crack. Like we can't, yeah. it's, it's everyone, you know, I've been talking to like every smart person I feel like in, in my periphery and everyone's like, yeah, no, there's just a fundamental dead end there. So I would say actually mm-hmm. though, from our experience feed in terms of like audio movers and zoom and there's like, you know, whatever, I wish at the very least there was some kind of, interface like this or just you know a site like this that could aggregate them all 
so that I don't have to keep, you know, changing my audio output settings depending on who I'm talking to or whatever. I mean, it gets easier, but it depends on what studio you're working with and what players you're working with. But if there was a way to have just all of like everybody's audio sort of controllable and all this stuff and like where you could have yeah. the zoom in one part of the screen. Like, I don't know, like something to aggregate it. So I don't have so many windows open all the time. I think that, would yeah. be nice, you know, I think Clearview <laughs> might do that, but it's no. expensive. You know, it's all the, right, right, right. that's the trick. Like, the good thing about audio movers is you can rent it for a day or whatever, Absolutely. or you can get the year mm. subscription, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Cool. Then it comes Here down to okay. <laughs> Yes. Has anyone had any spectacular fails? They were doing something ridiculously important and someone arrived or someone walked in. Has there been any particular dramatic things for you, Shabaka or Ben? Um, I had. I mean, it wasn't like the 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 most important recording or like something that couldn't be done the next day. But I had a recording, you know, for the Sunday Kemet album, where my my upstairs neighbour decided to just start singing these R and B songs. And she never really sings. <laughs> and I, you know, I never hear her. I don't, I don't hear anything. But, I've, you know, all of a sudden she started to sing really, really loudly. As in, you know, and not in a, a confrontation way. Just in, I feel like she just felt it that morning. She just really, like, wanted to sing. <laughs> and I'm just there thinking, I've really never heard anything from upstairs. But all of a sudden this, she's letting, letting it out. And you can't tell anyone that's just, you know, expressing themselves like that. Oh, sorry. I need to express myself professionally. So can you, um, yeah. you know, quiet down? Did you try bit. to duet or? Yeah. No, I just, um, I just left it in there. Actually, <laughs> you know. so Easter egg, amazing. So many yeah. crazy sampled like artifacts from our lived lives this year. I think there's so many <laughs> helicopters and things I worked on in all these. Yeah. And, you know, like a lot of things aren't, it's not that, you know, destructive if you've got some ambient sound in there, you know, it's just a bit more le levels, you know, a bit more layers, you know, obviously there are, there are limits to that, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think my, uh, my worst uh, recording fail was doing about an hour of uh, stuff to realize I'd left the HEPA filter on loud. Uh, but, you know, I'd had headphones on, I'd kind of just been in, in the moment, I hadn't really thought about it, but everything had this white noise all the way through it, and it just had to go again. <laughs> or it's a vibe, it's a vibe. <laughs> oh, it was so much more than a vibe, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We all like to think we did we do it better the second time, that's how I always think. I did a VO that there was seagulls throughout the entire thing and I hadn't noticed. And I decided to myself that it was definitely better the second time, just with a little edge of fury. Also, you only find out when you've got 10 minutes left to do an hour of work. Of course. Oh my God. So you get it right. Oh, so That's many the times that happened over lockdown where you would get all the way to the end of something and realize something got messed up in the way. And then exactly 10 hours of work in a half an hour or something, and you're like, I don't know. I can't believe that happened so much, actually. Yeah. Gave me a little bit of PTSD. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Sorry, the sweat. <laughs> so I think one more question, and then thank you very much. You've been great so far, but just one more question is, what advice would you give 18 months ago's you? What one sentence would you say, if you could, to get through it better? Got this one. Set boundaries. Because, you know, we're working from home, uh, there was no escape. The nice thing about getting out and doing stuff was there was there was a natural sort of break, whether you're in the car or you're walking. There, there was a there's a clear definition between home and work, and that that was erased for everyone. So setting boundaries, I think, is probably key to everyone's mental health. I'm so bad at it, I hadn't even thought of that, Ben. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good point. <laughs> to do that right now, know yourself, make boundaries now. Um, <laughs> um, I would say to myself then um, to I waited a long time to start moving on projects I let myself stall for a while um, because I wanted things to be this level of perfection um, that I was used to um, from my usual grind in studios and etc but I would say um, stop looking for the perfection and start learning how to fix things or work around you know use the imperfections or you know Learn isotope right now. Get isotope right now. <laughs> Get your work going. Exactly. That would be something. Um, yeah, I would just say do everything a bit quicker in terms of like the, 
the stuff that I there's a as the time went along, I realized that actually it's just about how much stuff you know in terms of what you, you need what I need to learn. Um so I put off, for instance, learning Ableton until I needed to, until like the necessity meant that I had to learn it. Whereas there was a bunch of time at the start of the lockdown when I could just be learning, have been learning a lot more new stuff about technology, even before I had the capability to use it. Um, and in retrospect, if I just spent that time really focusing, and obviously it's, it's easy to say that in retrospect, but if I spent the time focusing on just learning a whole bunch more stuff, which I did learn in the course of time, but like really in that period where we just had endless days of not knowing if the you know the world was going to come to a kind of crashing end or what you know in retrospect you know the world isn't coming to a crashing end and actually just watch those tutorials because you need some new skills you know that's what I've told myself yeah I think maybe mine would be work out what will make your life easier <laughs> as in <laughs> like everyone's as you said kind of doing a recording at home for the first time ever and I'm having to deal with all these things for the first time ever. So maybe it would be good, would have been good at the start for me to like write a little list of like, okay, here's how you do this, guys. Here's what will, you know, here's what will make it work really smoothly and efficiently. You know what I've learned? So just, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say like, but also enjoy enjoy the challenge and don't, I think as as you said, Shruti, there was a, a fear of like, will the quality go down from this new world and when we're back in studios and you know will people be complaining that the sound is different or stuff like that and actually that hasn't been the case it's just it's been different but it's been good so yeah enjoy the challenge okay like to your point for you like I was also taught during this time so I I didn't teach before but I started teaching at NYU and I realized that in the education space at the beginning of lockdown they were really so tapped in that they did do at the beginning they made these intense zoom tutorials and like walkthroughs to like onboard their students so I think in the education space props to everybody there but they really did that work Mm -hmm. they knew in the beginning that they had to get their students to keep going so all these teachers just didn't sleep for a week and made a bunch of videos teaching their students how to work remotely and um, I wish that like Hollywood had done that or the music industry had done that when I hear what these professors did I was sort of like why didn't we do that can we have those videos sorry exactly because it just took us all a while to be like to figure out how it's just denial. It was denial. <laughs> well, amazing. Thank you so much for this, Fee, Shabaka, Ben, Shruti. It's been so good. And I think I've learned a lot. And hopefully you watching, you've learned lots too. So thank you so much. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.